Um, one more minute because I'm generous. Cool. Um, why don't we get started? What do you guys think? Zoe, Prash, Ricky, Olivia? Happy to go when you are. Cool. Uh, so yeah, let's do it, guys. Welcome. Uh, welcome, everybody that's joining in from across the country, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, you're attending the first session of our Artificial Intelligence for Medical Students workshop. Uh, my name is Rohit. You can call me Ro. I am a third year MD PhD student here at the University of British Columbia. So for me, I have good weather, unlike the rest of Canada. Um, I, uh, I'm excited today to, to work with a great team uh, who I'll get to introduce themselves, uh, starting with, let's go Zoe. Oh yeah, so I'm a third year medical student here at Queens. Um, I went to McGill before this and I studied computer science and now I'm at Queens. Um, I've been doing research in image segmentation with ultrasound for the past two years and I guess I'm interested in radiology and AI, which is why I'm here. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, Olivia, do you want to go next? I'm not sure she's here. I think she said she had clinic. Here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm here for the first little bit and then I have to leave in a bit. But um, hi, everyone. My name is Olivia, second year at UBC. I did my master's at Queens um, on uh, some image recognition stuff and ultrasound. I'm currently also doing some ultrasound research uh, in COVID. Sweet. Awesome. Uh, and then we'll go to our instructors for the workshop. Uh, we'll go with Prash first. Hey, everyone. My name is Prash. So I'm a second year PhD student at UBC, although at the moment I'm actually living in Toronto. Uh, my PhD is in biomedical engineering and seems like ultrasound is a popular imaging modality today. And my research is also in ultrasound guided orthopedic surgery. Uh, before that, I um, studied engineering science in the UK and I'm really looking forward to doing this course. Where in the UK, Prash? I uh, was at Oxford <laughs> University. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. after that, I did my master's uh, in biomedical engineering at UBC as well. Yeah, you're fancy. Thanks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Prash is technically probably the only non-medical student here, but also knows the most about AI in this group. Um, <laughs> I was about to go to Ricky, but uh, go ahead, Ricky. That's okay. All right, my name is Ricky. I'm a second year medical student at Queens. I previously did AI research in my master's at UBC and you guessed it, ultrasound classification. Um, my background is in discrete mathematics and physics uh, from UBC, and I'm really excited to usher the second iteration of this course. Yeah, rad. Uh, for those of you that are just joining us, I see we've had a few stragglers come in. Uh, we'd love to hear from where you're joining us from. Uh, so just type in the school or city you're, you're at uh, in the chat box. Um, and while we wait for people to do that, I'll just kind of give you guys an overview of what to expect from this workshop. We really created this workshop with this intention of getting you just from knowing nothing about AI to knowing a little bit about AI um, and just getting a sense of where you can be positioning yourself as a future medical professional in this world of AI because it's not going to go anywhere. In fact, it's only going to be here to stay. Uh, we've seen our world transform uh, through the use of artificial intelligence, particularly in the last five to 10 years. Um, and you're gonna hear from two essentially near peers of yours, people that are uh, have somewhat of a similar training or similar experience um, and how they perceive and understand AI. We're not gonna try and teach you the math here. No one's expecting you to know any calculus. Uh, you probably barely know stats, um, but that's fine. We're here to get you to be a little bit critical of what AI looks like, uh, a little bit uh, able to define things and be able to talk the lingo a little bit. Um, so that after this workshop, at the end of uh, the six, five or six sessions, that you can go off and start doing your own projects or start collaborating a little bit more easily than what you can currently do. Um, the intent is, uh, if I haven't already said it, the intent is strictly for the novice. So if you know nothing, you're the perfect person to be here right now. If you know what a neural network is, we should discuss. Um, but overall, we have two great instructors for you. We have a great logistics team, and we're so happy to open this up nationwide. Uh, and I really hope you guys stick around. 
This year we had over 220 students across the country from nine different medical schools uh, express interest in this course. And uh, as you can see, we have 34 for this first session. And we're quite excited because that's about four, four, four times uh, what we previously have had. Anyways, uh, we're excited. Hopefully you're excited. I'm not gonna talk too much more and I'm gonna pass it over to Ricky Hugh to take the lead. Ricky, you wanna go? All right, thanks Rohit. So I'm one of the two instructors for today. Uh, today we'll just be going mainly, half of it will be an overview, but we wanna give you some concrete idea of what AI is. Uh, so first I have to give some boring disclaimers. Uh, we have no major conflicts of interest to disclose. We're funded by UBC, uh, the Biomedical Imaging Artificial Intelligence Research Cluster. We're hosted by jointly by the UBC Artificial Intelligence and Medicine Club and Queen's Innovation Medicine Club. And I'd like to extend a special thanks to the National Artificial Intelligence in Medicine Student Society Network for helping build a network of like-minded individuals for these events. So as for the agenda, um, everyone here is motivated for AI in some aspects. So this won't be like a visionary businessman TED talk where I'm trying to convince you how amazing AI is. But I'll still go over some motivation, uh, mainly to give you some concrete ideas. So when someone asks you like, what's AI? What's so good about AI? You can give some really good concrete technical examples. There'll be some examples and some background and then Prash will talk about some uh, technical details of when you should use AI and limitations of it. Um, essentially, it's going to be a dip bit different from those YouTube videos you've seen hyping up AI. We're giving you a healthy dose of skepticism with technical detail. So, so our core objective is that we want to give you enough knowledge so that you're comfortable analyzing AI application in the future. Whether you like it or not, AI is coming. Um, we want you to be able to, for instance, take an AI journal uh, that has some medical application and read it and know if this it's legit or not. And we also want to give you enough resources so, such that if you want to pursue AI in the future, you know which direction to go to further train yourself. So rule of thumb, for instance, we want you to, after this course, look at this image and know that, hey, this is a, this is a neural network. These are neural network nodes for image detection and that, hey, this could be applicable for medical imaging, but this is really bad for, let's say, like EMR diagnosis with bad data formats. So these are a lot of buzzwords you always hear in the media, like a neural network, uh, activation map, um, you know, a, a neuron kernel, a state function. These actually all mean the same thing, but people use a bunch of different words for it. Um, and really, we hope that you're comfortable with terms like these. Not You don't need to know the math, but knowing the general idea of how these work and whether they're applicable to your clinical scenario is, is very, very useful. And if there's one thing I hope everyone takes uh, away from this course, it's it's uh, during our second week, our data uh, data science section is uh, what cross validation is. It's very very important data science. We don't really get exposure to it in our uh, medical biostatistics careers, but it's one thing that's very important. So that's just giving you a, a bit of foreshadowing. So we'll give around thirty to forty minutes of instruction. Um, this is with embedded Q and A, so that time might uh, differ from session to session. Um, and we'll give you some real, real examples, hopefully relate to medicine. And then at the end, we'll have a programming workshop. So this is a Python terminal. This is what you'll be building. We'll give you some code. We'll guide you through step by step. We'll tell you what code to write, what it means, so that you know uh, generally how to set up an AI program that if you want to work on in the future, you can look up resources and you won't feel as lost. This is completely at your own pace. It's for your own knowledge and understanding. So if you want to take notes, take notes, um, but there's no mandatory participations or exams or anything. So boring logistics, everything's on the website. Uh, it's on all the emails on every email. Uh, these sessions are roughly seven, six to 7 p.m. Uh, I can stay a bit longer afterwards if there are more questions, except the week of November 3rd, because some people have a big exam that week. We'll send most of our messages uh, through email or Slack. So I suggest everyone join the Slack channel. Uh, so it's, it's in the email and everything. We'll give announcements there. People can ask questions, everything. It's just a great way to communicate. Now, this is the flex slide, but you already know us already, so I don't have to talk through this slide. Essentially, Prash and I, we have some AI background in our graduate studies, Prash more so than I, and we'll be teaching the technical component. And then we also have a logistics teams of medical students, which you've already met. Now, so, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try doing this. Um, I'm trying doing this uh, pull everywhere thing, so bear with me. So 
I like to let's see, let's see if this works on your web browser on your phone or or uh, or your computer. It'll, they'll show you a link and go to the link and then enter in what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word AI. Just one or two words. We'll see. We'll see if this works. There's about a fifty percent chance success rate when uh, instructors do this. Matrix. Diagnosis. Nice. Okay. Computers. Aliens. So it's going with the Matrix theme again. Robot. It's a lot of sci-fi theme. Okay, I have to tilt my head a bit. Lost. Lost jobs. Lost jobs or tech jobs? Or just lost? Bot stealing. Scary. Okay. Give it a few more seconds. Hype, overlords. Okay. Okay. So it looks like a lot of this is a lot of sci-fi themed words like automation, robots, aliens, and everything. And this is on par with what we expect. There's a lot of trepidation with AI. Uh, and what AI can do. We, we always think it's like the Matrix or it's like um, that movie. I think the movie is called AI in 2001. Uh, robots, think sentient robots that can do everything. And throughout this course, we hope you'll get more ideas, more detailed ideas of what AI actually is and everything. But it's good to, to screen what people think so far. So I'll give you a, a very bare bones definition of AI. AI is just a machine system computer that can analyze its environment and complete a task, right? Very simple, pedantic definition. But then you'll say, hey, isn't, isn't a vending machine AI? It receives the environment information of someone pressing a button, and then it does a task of dispensing, you know, a Coke Zero. So there's this new definition that's come, new um, part of definition that's coming out, which is that these tasks have to require natural intelligence. So when I first saw this in like AI journals, I'm like, what the heck does this mean? Because this, this just opens up a can of worms. What is natural intelligence? Well, it's, it's not, you're not going to be satisfied with the answer, but it's, it's really something that required, is not a immediately simple task. It's not just getting point A to point B with really defined steps that you can just automate with one equation. So this brings the idea of the AI effect. Um, tasks that we thought were hard and AI before in the past, they're not considered AI anymore, right? So for instance, early character recognition, where a camera takes a picture of a photo and it's able to convert, let's say, te uh, someone's handwriting into text, that was considered AI before, but now there are very concrete visual computing algorithms that can do it that some people would argue is not AI. Um, Siri on your iPhone in the beginning, uh, it was just going through the flowchart of the text you enter, going through a database of what responses it can generate. And people say, that's not AI, you're just looking up things. It's a very simple task. Uh, but now Siri is a bit more complicated. So, And uh, like a robot that only passes butter. Three points to anyone that gets that, that reference. So this is still subject philosophical debate. So this gives rise to the, uh, further delineation of what's weak AI and strong AI. So weak AI is any application where there's a narrow scope, like only one task, like a robot that only passes butter. Uh, where strong AI, you, ha you, you have a lot more generalizable tasks. You can do a lot more things, like a, think a fully sentient robot from, from your favorite cartoon. So now that these boring definitions are out of the way, the big, the cool kid on the block right now is machine learning. So what is machine learning? Well, we define AI already. It's something that can you know, sense its environment and complete a task. Machine learning is just one method of applying AI where you have some intricate machinery but every time that machine completes a task, it'll look at how well it's doing and update its machinery. It's like, it's like um, for instance, a robot that's learning to play basketball. It'll try to shoot the ball into the hoop, and then it'll look how much it misses to adjust and reshoot it with better accuracy. That essentially is machine learning. The learning part is just uh, the AI machine updating itself. And then you'll hear this a lot of time on in the news and everything. Deep learning is just machine learning with a lot of intricate intermediate math steps. That's, that's all we need to know. Essentially, 
for for most applications, machine learning and deep learning, they're part of the same general idea. Deep learning is just more complex. You get more complex uh, output. So I'm going to skip this second poll everywhere because uh, this is a slog. So there's some uh, examples that I want to share. So there was this original example where I want to share a video interpolation, but then yesterday NVIDIA just came up with a brand new video of uh, their even better, even more advanced uh, video interpolation. I'll show this, this two minute video. Okay. Computer vision researchers just invented something amazing that basically replaces a video codec with a neural network which reduces bandwidth consumption by orders of magnitude. We call it AI video compression. With more than 10 million video streams estimated to be live at any given time, video conferencing is the new connectivity challenge for many. Let me show you how it works. The mechanism behind AI assisted video calls is simple. A sender first transmits a reference image of the caller, just like today's systems that typically use a compressed video stream. Then, rather than sending a fat stream of pixel-packed images, it sends data on the locations of key facial points around the caller's eyes, nose, and mouth. A generative adversarial network, or GAN, on the receiver side then uses the initial image and the key points to reconstruct the subsequent images. As a result, much less data is sent over the network. Slow internet connection and limited bandwidth will not impact the quality of video meetings anymore. Let's take a look at this side-by-side -side comparison. H.264 compression standard on the left and NVIDIA AI video compression on the right. Besides the bandwidth consumption, you can see the obvious visual quality as well by providing significant cost savings for data transfers in the cloud. Reducing bandwidth consumption significantly improves the video conferencing experience for end users who can enjoy more features while streaming less And the rest is just NVIDIA plugging themselves, so I won't, I won't show you the rest. But I want to show you another example, too. Though. So keep in mind, this is, this is super cool. They throw out some cool words. Everything is sort of intuitive until they say GAN, uh, the adversarial network. So that's, that's the part that we hope to introduce you to sometime in the course so that you'll understand most of what the video is talking about. And also keep a bit of skepticism. This is produced by NVIDIA, although they're the giants of AI right now. Of course, their you know, primary priority is stonks and making money. So this might not be as perfect as it seemed, but this is hot off the press and it's quite exciting. So this is the second, second one. So this is a cool one. This is a really cool one. On Earth, the simple rules of natural selection and competition led to the evolution of increasingly intelligent life forms. Today, we ask if comparably simple rules and multi-agent competition can also lead to intelligent behavior in a new virtual world. These agents are playing hide and seek. These agents have just begun learning, but they've already learned to chase and run away. This is a hard world for a hider who has only learned to flee. However, after training in millions of rounds of hide and seek, the hiders find a solution. The hiders learn to use rudimentary tools to their advantage. By grabbing and locking these blocks, they can create their own shelter. The seekers are locked in place for a brief period at the start of the game, giving hiders a chance to prepare. Even so, the hiders must learn to collaborate, accomplishing tasks that would be impossible for any single individual. The hiders are not the only ones who can learn to use tools. After many generations of failing to break into the shelter, the seekers learn to jump over obstacles using ramps. However, after many millions of rounds of having their shelter breached, the hiders learn to take away the primary tool the seekers have at their disposal. Note that we did not explicitly incentivize any of these behaviors. As each team learns a new skill, it implicitly changes the challenges the other team faces, creating a new pressure to adapt. We've also put these agents into a more open-ended environment, randomizing the objects, team sizes, and walls. In this world, they learn to construct their own shelter from scratch, requiring that they arrange multiple objects into precise structures. To prevent seekers from using the ramps, the hiders move them to the edge of the play area and lock them in place. We originally believed this would be the final strategy that the agents learn. 
However, we found that after more training, the seekers discovered that they can jump on top of boxes and surf them to the hider's shelter. In the last stage of emergent strategy that we observed, the hiders learn to lock as many boxes as they can before constructing their fort in order to defend against box surfing. So how do agents acquire these skills? They're trained using reinforcement learning, an algorithm inspired by the way animals on Earth learn. The agents play thousands of rounds of hide-and-seek in parallel for many days. They train against each other as well as past versions of themselves using an algorithm called self-play. Co-evolution and competition on Earth led to the only generally intelligent species known to date, humans. While this world is far less complex than Earth, we have found evidence that simple rules can lead to increasingly intelligent behavior from multi-agent interaction. We hope that with a much larger and more diverse environment, truly complex and intelligent agents will one day emerge. Okay, so that was, that was a really cool example, and that really reinforces the idea of machine learning. You have some base, you know, mathematical way to try and uh, act as an input-output mm -hmm. machine, but that mm -hmm. thing updates every single time so that you decrease the, uh, the error afterwards. Mm -hmm. And this is just another, like, really simple example, noise removal from, a, also again, NVIDIA. So you can see how this might apply to medical imaging. Like, ultrasound images are really grainy. They give medical students a lot of trouble. So maybe somehow in the future, AI can reduce the noise in ultrasound images. Okay. Now, uh, the question is, how long that entire learning process took? I, I don't know, but I'm assuming on the order of magnitude of, of days, days to weeks. Um, because I can that that sort of neural network requires millions and millions of parameters, and just iterating it through, let's say a hundred times, takes overnight on some of the best uh, graphical units. So these are some other examples of what AI might be able to do in medicine. I'll just go over some really quickly. Like surgical guidance is a big one, highlighting where tumors are and everything. Uh, detection in medical imaging, automated detection in pathology. From your histology classes, this is always a pain, so maybe AI can improve in the future. Now, before I move on, are there any, any questions that anyone wants to ask about this intro examples and definition? Feel free, if you have any questions, feel free to type in the chat or uh, use the raise hand function. Okay, so I'll go through some really quick misconceptions. Uh, one is that AI does not need humans. This is absolutely false. At the moment, there are no FDA-approved AI systems for any high-risk medical tasks. Uh, AI is still requires human programming, human tuning afterwards, and human analysis to improve. Um, so yeah, we're not we're not at Ultron level yet. We're I'm, we're pretty much just programming in our in our own computers right now. Okay, the next misconception is that AI is completely objective. This is again false. A lot of people say, well, AI is going to come into uh, the judicial system. We're going to have AI judges. I don't see this happening for the next 100 or 200 years. AI is created by humans, so we inherently inject our subjective biases into that. Last misconception is that AI, if you just give, a doctor can just take a bunch of data, give it to an engineer, hey, you can just figure it out and complete the task for me. Um, this is not true. Again, AI, there's a lot of machinery requiring humans to build in order for AI application to complete. And throughout this course, we hope you understand what type of machinery that is and what sort of steps you need to take in order to complete that machinery. So for Westworld Watchers, we don't have Rehobram and uh, Arnold or Bernard yet. So luckily. Okay, so then why do we use AI if there are so many limitations and everything? Well, you can accomplish things faster, right? So for instance, the AI that was created in, in my lab to look at ultrasound images to extract some anatomy, uh, when I had to do it manually, it took me a week to, to highlight a thousand images, but the AI did it in five seconds, right? They could, and this, they also do things automatically. So this is particularly useful in low resource settings where say you don't have a specialist and some AI program that has been built with specialists in a tertiary center can be exported to these regions and you can say start a screening program with these AI applications. So things that are faster and more automatic, when companies look at it, they immediately think stonks and money, right? So we look at the seed funding in the in the last however many years, and this is 2019, so 2020 is even higher. It's just an absolute you know, exponential increase. So the bookies and the investors are putting a lot of money into it, which means they have a high confidence that it'll work. 
The other thing is AI can complete things maybe without human error. And this is still a subject of the deba debate. As you can see, no FDA-approved AI application for diagnosis exists yet. So this still needs some work. And then this is the one that a lot of people have trouble with, AI analyzing things with great complexity. Like that hide-and-seek example, the way they analyze, they, there's a lot of mathematical intermediate steps to analyze it. So what does that exactly mean? So I'll give a motive big example. Um, this is chess AI. So this is Gary Kasparov against Deep Blue. So the first step was the humans were able to create a computer that was able to beat the best chess player in the world right now, uh, back then, Gary Kasparov. That's the first step. Well, what happened after was a lot more interesting. So we looked, they opened the computer and they looked at well, how did it beat Gary Kasparov? And they found that certain moves the computer was making, humans didn't think were good moves. And the AI was able to look 10, 15 moves ahead using certain patterns that these moves actually increase the probability of winning. So what happened next was that uh, humans start training with these computers. So this is this is a online application called Lee Chess. Um, this is me losing to someone. So this AI that they run in the background, every move I make, they give me they give a score, an advantage score to a certain players, saying, "Hey, this move gave you." an extra 2% probability of winning, for instance. And in the end, you can summarize and see how many mistakes you made based on this AI analysis. So in a way, when we made AI, AI is also making humans better, such that now the world champion, Magnus Carlsen, can absolutely beat Kasparov. So in the future, and then it's an iterative cycle, stronger AI is built now. So the most recent chess AI, Stockfish 12 and Alpha Zero, they can absolutely beat like Deep Blue 100 to 0 easy. So that's, that's the benefit of having greater complexity. So an analogy to, analogy to uh, sorry, uh, medicine, let's say we have, uh, this is an ultrasound image. Um, let's say we're trying to predict disease based off ultrasound images. So, okay, first we use a gold standard as our physician analysis, and then we figure out that, um, that it's able to predict with similar accuracy to, to physicians. Um, now, sorry. So what we do next is that we look at look in the AI which regions of the ultrasound image is the AI saying is really really important for prediction. So we found like these regions with the red spots. Well, these are these are really highly predictive regions. So what we can do next is that we can work with pathology when it excites these regions ex vivo and see exactly what's causing these regions to trigger that AI response. So now we're finding new regions in developing new knowledge in medicine to, from AI to give us a further understanding of how tissue changes in disease. Um, and this is, this is just a really exciting avenue that I see AI going, uh, working together with humans. So the people that say AI will replace humans, personally, I think they're wrong. I think AI is going to be a physician aid tool that will make better physicians in the future. So, now, we're trained in, in medicine to, we're trained with a lot of classical inferential statistics. For instance, this is the classic t-test. It's okay if you, you don't know it, but this is, this is when we're comparing two da different data sets. Usually, let's say, a control group and a group where we provide some sort of drug treatment. And then we use a t-test to say, well, is there a difference between their means? Uh, this is great to, for descriptive applications when we want to describe if the effect was statistically significant. But then the question is now, what do we do with that result? Because um, certain patients, how do we, for instance, know when to use a drug or not? Or let's say, when to predict if a disease occurs or not, given that we have some, some variable has some statistical significant difference. So AI is based on inferential statistics, where we look at, we use methods to uh, look at the relationships between the data so that we can make things that can complete the task with this inferential data. So it's, um, it, you don't have to know a lot of the math. You just, further in the, in the particularly in the data science uh, session next week, you'll learn that uh, knowing this extra step of how AI works to further look at data in an inferential way is really, really beneficial for, for clinical practice and clinical analysis of your clinical data. So the question is, well, okay, why not just leave it to engineers, right? Why, in, this data is just numbers, why not just leave it to engineers to work with AI? Well, I'll give you an example of what happened, right? So we, in one of our group projects, we had some cool technology that we, we made and we showed it to doctors. It was this like small medical device. 
one of the physicians were like, okay, well, this is really hard to use. It's bulky and everything. Yeah, it works and everything, but you need to be good with computers to use it. We don't want to use it. Or this doesn't achieve exactly what we want in, in let's say it was Vancouver in the time. Um, it might work in like a, in, a, in a rural area, but not in an urban area. Or we just never want to use this. The, the culture is such that we never want to change unless we, there's, you can convince us it's good enough. On the flip side, there are situations where physicians have come and say like, hey, this is a problem, this is a clinical problem, can you just use AI to fix it? And then the engineer might say, okay, well, what exactly are we trying to fix? You're just saying, do it better, but are, do you want better accuracy? Do you want uh, better outcomes? Uh, and a common problem is that, okay, well, the data is, is kind of inconsistent, it's from a bunch of different centers. AI won't work with bad data. And this, this is also very important that we'll talk about next week. And of course, there's always times where we're like, it's just completely infeasible at this moment. Maybe try again in 50 years. So hopefully coming out of this course, um, you'll be a combination of both the physician and, and the engineering side. Not You don't have to have full technical knowledge, but enough insight such that you can bridge the gap between these two. And I put this into an AI face morpher, and this is what we got. So you can uh, take this image and do what you want with it. If you're still asking like why medical students, again, like Zoolander, um, there's also a social aspect for AI, right? AI, and from that word cloud before, AI is a bit scary. You know, we might not know how it works. And as physicians, we're often the gatekeepers and we're entrusted to analyze if something's medically safe or not. For instance, Dr. Richard Resnick, previous dean of Queen's Medicine, um, was on several AI councils to analyze how to usher AI into medicine. And a lot of uh, AI tech giants, like I think Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, maybe not Zuckerberg, I don't know if this is Zuckerberg or not, but they're like, we don't want AI weapons. It's, it's, it's just a big can of worms, we're not gonna have it. So in the medical field, physicians have a very strong role to analyze how AI works in our work, in our, our field. And having the knowledge of both sides is really, really beneficial in this case. These are just some fun examples. Uh, I went on Reddit and looked at artificial intelligence and it's it's about 99% hype articles saying, I think this one's like um, autism, this a autism diagnosis AI has 99% accuracy. Another one's like uh, AI can detect Alzheimer at 98% accuracy, better than uh, geriatrics physicians. All this is just hype right now. They're all in the absolute baby steps. Um, if you want technical details, they're all overfitted to a certain data set with low sample sizes. They're not cross-validated at all. They're not gener generalizable. Hope after two or three weeks in, this, in these sessions, hopefully you'll understand what it means and you can appraise articles like these. This guy's always fun. Um, so this is last year. Elon Musk says we'll have self-driving cars by the end of the year in 2019. Well, it's 2020 and according to my friends at Tesla, their cars can't even make left turns during the rain yet. So there's a lot of hype and hopefully with sufficient knowledge, you can moderate this hype. So as medical students and future clinicians, I see three big roles that we can play. One is just, we're just users of AI. Um, this doesn't mean we don't know much about AI or we don't care about AI, but that we can use AI efficiently in the workplace. We're not scared of it and we know what it can do and cannot do. The second role that we can uh, pursue is more of an analyst. This is like sitting in a research team saying, hey, there's this clinical problem. Maybe AI can solve this. Well, I'm gonna look at my AI knowledge and my medical knowledge and see if this is feasible or not. Another role, if you wanna pursue this path, you can pursue a more technical engineering role where you can be building the application or maybe designing the neural network architecture for your AI application. And all of these are potential avenues that you can pursue. It's not, in, it's not insurmountable for all you bright medical students. but Particularly for this course, we're gonna focus on these, preparing you for these two roles. Now, there are several resources out there that we'll share with you all. Um, so I'm, this is a two-dimensional graph comparing the depth versus the speci how specific uh, either theory-based or application-based certain resources are. So we're here. We're gonna focus on medical applications with basic general overview of AI. Um, another one that's similar is called Fast AI. So this is a very programming heavy course online. Immediately they, they will 
they give you some Python code and tell you to adjust some parameters. And they assume you have some technical knowledge, but they really it's really for industry programmers and you don't even need much math knowledge to take this course. So there's a question, how much background do you think a medical student would need to be able to take on that engineer role? Um, a rough idea, I'd say around a year or a year's worth of ramping up, um, you will need a bit of, I, Honestly, first year mathematics is sufficient. Some first year calculus, maybe a bit of multivariate calculus uh, and linear algebra, and also knowing how a bit of programming. Um, there are some great resources out there for you to learn this role. And even if you go self-directed, let's say, let's say you have a project that your preceptor is giving you. Uh, I have a bunch of clinical variables, and I want you to predict if this person is getting heart disease or not. Well, if you look online, uh, with the resources that we give you, you understand that this is a classification problem. So if you Google classification um, Python examples, you'll see some work that people have already done and then there'll be some math in in those examples, but it ta it'll take about a year to understand all that math and then apply those examples to, to your work. So it's definitely feasible for a medical student. Um, or even like, two or three months full time. It's, it's, I've seen people be able to pick it up really quickly. So if you want to start from the, the ground up, this is the most famous course out there. Uh, Andrew Ng from Stanford. He's, uh, well, he, I say he was a big time AI researcher. I think he's, he has a bunch of AI finance firms that he's making a lot of money off now. But this is, a, this is one of the best courses out there. It starts from the linear algebra and from the calculus showing you exactly how AI works so you'll know the ins and outs of it. It's like going to mechanic school and knowing how every single piece of the car fits together and how it'll work. Um, I'm putting this one here because it's one I'm familiar with. UBC also has a great course. It's a bit more in depth with the math. Um, and then really the king of the castle for a modern AI is Stanford's uh, convolutional neural network course. This They go a bit deep in the math, but it's they show you the state of, what's the state of the art. Um, even if you don't know the math, looking through a few of these videos, uh, seeing the accuracies that they can achieve and what tasks they can achieve with their methods gives you really good insight to say, hey, for this application, I know that these Stanford guys have done it. Maybe we can recruit some engineers and see if they can apply this, this method too. So this is, this is, I highly recommend this if you need something really state of the art and you wanna know what's out there. Um, Honestly, most medical applications are, they, they, the uh, research gap is that a lot of them aren't at the state of the art yet. Even going through uh, some really basic AI algorithms that will show you, you'll have a big differential over the current, um, current performance of current algorithms. So at this point, uh, I'll take a two to three minute question break. If anyone has any questions, feel free to ask in the chat or, or speak up on the microphone. Yeah, I quickly define neural network. That's a great question. So a neural network is a specific machine learning method. And I think the best way to do this is to give an example. So there's some there's some input. Um, let's say it's it's a bunch of clinical variables, you know, age, uh, BMI, height, income. Okay, and what we're gonna do with these variables is that we're gonna do a bunch of mathematical in, independent mathematical operations, and this is represented as a bunch of circles, right? Let's say this is this calculates your uh, mean of all variables, right? Totally unrealistic, but let's just say it does that. And this calculates the median, however, this is another, another math, uh, mathematical function. It's another one, another one, right? And then what you do is that you pass this input to these functions. And these ones will, you'll do more math into them, right? And then these, the output for these intermediate functions are serve as input to your extra functions. And at the end, you get, let's say one, an output that corresponds to a prediction. Let's say if you have um, peripheral vascular disease percentage, right? It'll give you, let's say, it gives you 0.8. So the neural network part is that we go through all these mathematical functions 
and then look at our output and see what the error is. And then the goal of the neural network is to reduce this, this error to zero. You want to minimize the error. All right. And the way we do this is that each, each one of these branches has some weight to it. Let's say weight one is 0 0.5. And this weight is, in a general sense, it's how important this, this previous variable is. So the ones that are not important, you'll wait, your weight will go to zero. The ones that are important, you'll go to one. Um, and it's, it's just this method of having a lot of intermediate math functions, constantly updating it to change the weights so that in the end, we keep uh, the math functions that are really, really important. And this is really useful when you, we need to model something that's really, really complex. Like, uh, like those robots playing that hide and seek game. Well, how do you define like walking left, walking right, and moving that block and everything? Well, they have like maybe a million math functions in between. And then these math functions are optimized so that you only keep the ones that, that you really need. Uh, we'll go more in depth into this in like, yeah, it, what Rohit said. This is a very speedy explanation. We'll go, we'll try to explain it a lot more clearly and a lot more slowly in the uh, upcoming weeks. It's done solely through repetition. Uh, so it's done through a way, there's an elegant method. It's called uh, backpropagation. It gets a little bit in depth in math. I'll try to explain it in two sentences. So when we have this output, we want to minimize this output, right? So this is a calculus problem. And because this last node is a function of all the previous nodes, right? So this is f of g of h of i of x. So we can, because it's a function of all these nodes, we can use uh, the chain rule to take derivatives uh, backwards. So that if we often, once we'll change the previous node and then we'll change update the node before and then we'll update the node before in a way that optimizes that last node using using vector calculus we'll explain that like on a very general sense i think in week four but the method is called back propagation specifically a gradient descent in most cases yeah yeah exactly what rohit said it's telling the algorithm it's wrong until it gets it right it's taking derivatives back, doing calculus from last point all the way to the first point. Uh, it goes through, it de depends, certain, certain methods, uh, certain architecture, it goes through every single point, every single branch for each node. Certain uh, algorithms go with like a whole layer at a time, going back to the other layer. Um, yeah, but this is, this is a very high, highly specific detail. That's uh, um, as long as you know that it's able to optimize by t doing a bunch of optimization calculus from the last node to the first node, that's sufficient enough to, to uh, apply this knowledge. Okay, so now uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Prash who will talk more a bit about uh, specific uh, AI limitations and everything. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Thanks, Ricky. Um, so for uh, anyone new who joined us uh, since the beginning of this session, my name is Prash. Uh, I'm a PhD student in biomedical engineering, and I'll be covering some of the technical aspects of AI in this course. Um, so let's go. Um, as Ricky mentioned at the beginning, uh, really in today's session, I'm trying to cover when you should use AI and when you shouldn't use AI and what exactly AI is in a slightly more technical sense than, than Ricky did, but not, uh, not mathematics heavy. You don't really have to know anything uh, as a prerequisite. It's just, uh, I'm building on a very simple case study. So hopefully you can uh, see some of the themes that we're going to revisit in the next few weeks. Um, so when should you use AI? Uh, one of the key things to understand about AI algorithms, whether it's machine learning, deep learning, or anything else that we talk about, is that it's only one of the many tools that you can use to understand and interpret data. So just like you can calculate the mean of a bunch of numbers or calculate the median, uh, you know, do some t-tests like Ricky mentioned to determine if uh, the data that you have from one distribution is different from another distribution, AI is just one of those tools that you may choose to use if it's suitable for your data. And today I really want to uh, 
uh, impress on you how to understand when it is suitable for your data. It's important to know this because if you get it wrong and you just use AI without knowing why you're using it and if you're using it appropriately, it can be embarrassing. So here's actually a famous, I say famous, but it's, it's kind of famous in the AI circle. Uh, there was this uh, journal article published in Nature actually, and the authors, um, you know, I wish I had Ricky's uh, fancy pen. Um, okay, I have a pointer. Um, but it was published in Nature and the authors actually showed that you can use deep learning to uh, predict what aftershock patterns you can get after significant earthquakes. And so they collected some data, they, uh, they created this deep learning algorithm and they found that the algorithm could predict with very high accuracy uh, what the aftershock patterns would look like. Um, and so this was out for a few weeks, but then some AI researchers who were computer scientists actually showed that based on the data that uh, these authors had published, which they'd made open source, that it was actually not necessary to use a very complex algorithm, but in fact, they could just use one neuron, which is the equivalent of something called logistic regression to predict aftershock patterns. And this actually became a bit of like an embarrassment showing how many, many authors and uh, many researchers who aren't from the field of AI will just apply AI to uh, problems that don't need it. Um, and so it's really important to know when to use, when to use these methodologies. So to kind of make you understand and see how, how to do it, I'm going to just uh, walk through this very simple example that I totally made up. Uh, it's not at all realistic or it doesn't really mean anything, but I just wanted to um, show you how you can determine if uh, the problem you have at hand is suitable for AI. So let's say you work at a family practice, maybe you're interning uh, as a clerk or you're actually a family, family doctor uh, and you have a bunch of patients who want to stop smoking. So they have started to uh, go through the process of quitting and you are doing a very uh, simple research project where you collect their weight and you also tabulate how long it took for them to stop smoking in days. So your data might look something like this. In one column, you've got the weight and then the days to stop smoking uh, and so on for each patient. Now, this just looks like a bunch of numbers, but say the first thing you might do after you have uh, 30 patients uh, who've completed the study is to visualize the data. And so let's say you plot on the x-axis that the patient's weight and on the y-axis, the number of days it takes to stop smoking. Now, hopefully the first thing you kind of see is that there is some sort of trend here. Uh, it seems like as the patient's weight increases, it actually takes longer for them to stop smoking. So what do you do with this data? Well, let's say a new patient comes in uh, he, under your care and he is 85 kilograms and he tells you that he wants to stop smoking. What do you tell them? Uh, you wanna manage their expectations so they're as successful as possible. Well, you could simply say, well, I, I had 30 patients before you uh, and the mean, that, uh, the mean number of days that it took for them to stop smoking was about 85. And you could just tell them that um, and say that, okay, well, it should take you roughly 85 days to stop smoking. But you could actually go one step further. And since you noticed that uh, correlation before in the, in the data that you plotted, you could say, well, hang on, I, I can plot this linear trend that I have in my data. And now I can see that, okay, you're 85 kilograms. Maybe actually it will take you more like 95 to 100 days to quit smoking, not 85. And this would be perhaps a better estimate for them. And maybe they'd be more successful knowing that uh, going in. All right, so hopefully from this very simple example, you can see two things. And this is kind of what I want you to really take away from this. So when should you use AI? When you know or suspect that there is some pattern in your data. So in this case, by plotting the data, you could, you could see that there is a very simple linear correlation. Uh, and so you can use something called linear regression to, to fit this. And the purpose of the AI algorithm is really to learn this pattern. So there is a distinction here. You don't need to know what the pattern is. You just need to know or suspect that there is one. And then it's the AI algorithm's job to figure out what, whatever that pattern is. 
And the second thing to, uh, so to qualify the use of AI is that you want to be able to predict the outcome on a new data point. So the AI that learns this pattern, uh, you can, the AI will use the pattern to sort of predict on new data that you get in. So for new patients that come in with different weights, you can use the learn model to give them uh, a better expectation of how many days it will take for them to stop smoking. So we can use these uh, simple rules or simple definitions uh, to also quantify when you shouldn't use AI. So pattern and prediction, those are the two words that I uh, want you to know. So you shouldn't use AI when there isn't a pattern and or if the pattern is very simple. Now, it's important to know that um, there's almost never the case that a pattern doesn't exist and it's just purely noisy. So to kind of de demonstrate what I mean by that, imagine you have, um, imagine you, you did this research study and you only have uh, data from this range. So you only have patients who are between like 64 and, and uh, 69 kilograms. So I've generated more data in this using the same trend actually. But if you plotted the data here, it's actually not very clear that there is a pattern. This looks like it's just noise or there's no uh, correlation between the two variables. So you might look at this data if this is all you have and say, ah, you don't have a pattern. So this is kind of just pointless. But the truth here is actually you don't have enough data in the range that you need to notice the pattern. And that's the importance of data when using AI. So one of the most important things to know is that it's, it's very rare that the pattern doesn't exist in your data. It's more that you don't have enough data to perform uh, good pattern recognition. So uh, the limitations of data are very important to know for your algorithm. And uh, secondly, if you don't actually need to predict anything from your data, if you're just trying to figure out in the 30 patients that you had, what, was their, uh, what were the days that it took for them, each of them to stop smoking, and you don't really care about new data or new patients, and you don't need to use AI to uh, model anything. Now, what's, what, do I, what do I mean by the second point here that the pattern is very simple? So in the previous example, you might've thought that the pattern is very simple, uh, it's clearly a linear trend. You don't need to use AI for such a simple problem. But actually, uh, using linear regression to fit this line is actually a type of machine learning because you're using the data to identify a pattern. Um, now, consider this case where you have patients, uh, and it seems that below 75 kilograms, it kind of takes the same number of days for all of them to stop smoking, uh, approximately like 30, 34. And then for some reason, as soon as they jump above 75 kilograms, it takes uh, sort of 64 days. Now you could use AI here to essentially fit a classifier, which says, well, if you are below 75 kilograms, it'll take you 34 days to quit smoking. If you're above 75 kilograms, it will take you 64 days to stop smoking. But it's kind of unnecessary because you can clearly see that yourself. Um, and this is the same situation as before. Like imagine if you published a paper on this data and you said deep learning can predict how many days it takes for you to stop smoking. And this was the data that you showed it on. Clearly it would be ridiculed because the whole point of this is not really the deep learning part, but the fact that you collected this data, which is simple, but revealing. Um, and I kind of wanted to play this interactive game. Uh, well, I'm just going to check the chat to see if there's anything. Um, okay, so Nancy, you asked, uh, what if you want to look for a more hidden or less discernible pattern? Um, yes, yeah, so you don't have to, as I mentioned, you don't have to know what the pattern is, or you don't even have to be able to understand what the pattern is. You could just have a ton of variables that um, you kind of know or suspect that they're linked in some way. You can throw it into your AI algorithm and then um, see what patterns emerge. So how can you suspect a pattern in data if it's not discernible by humans? Uh, well, that's usually where the scientific foundations come into hand. So you, know, you might suspect that uh, weight has something to do with morbidity or uh, uh, anything like that. So even though you can't necessarily see 
maybe in the center that you're working in, but if you collect enough data from multiple different centers, from patients with broad enough characteristics, uh, if you suspect that there is a link based on some sort of scientific uh, biological principles underneath, then you can use artificial intelligence and machine learning to figure out uh, if there is actually a pattern. And in the next few weeks, I won't really talk about this today, but in the next few weeks, I, uh, we will discuss how you can test whether that AI model that you uh, taught uh, or the AI model that learned on the data that you had is actually successful or if it learned nothing at all. So there are obviously cases where you could throw a bunch of data and for some reason you suspect that there are some patterns in that data. Your AI algorithm will definitely come up with something, but then um, we can use validation techniques to figure out if what it learned actually means something or if it's actually noise. And that's a discussion for future weeks. Um, one of the interesting things that Ricky said earlier in this, uh, in this uh, session was that it's kind of philosophical what it means to exhibit natural intelligence. Uh, I wanted to make it a bit more concrete than that and say uh, the ability to recognize patterns is what uh, is one of the key signs of both artificial and natural intelligence. So here is like a quick uh, interactive game that I wanted to play with you guys just to show and demonstrate that. And I hope that no one has seen the slides uh, before because otherwise this won't be as fun and you know what I'm showing here. So this is a portion from an x-ray and um, I want to, I want you guys to guess which part of the body this is from. Um, and you guys can either put in the chat or, or shout out. And once there are enough guesses, I'll, I'll keep going. Okay, so I can see pelvis, lungs, hip. Okay, interesting. All right, so I'm gonna give you a bit more information. So here, I'm revealing more and more of the x-ray. What do you guys think it is? Okay, getting neck, hand, shoulder, scapula. All right, a little bit more. I think it's, it's becoming quite, quite clear. Ankle, <laughs> not human x-ray. That's a good one. Scapula rotated. Okay, so yeah, that is exactly correct. Um, well done. So it is the scapula, the shoulder joint, uh, and I have rotated it 90 degrees counterclockwise. So here's the here's the X-ray that I stole from Google. Um, so well done for getting that right. Um, <laughs> but the point of all of this was to show that at the beginning. Uh, obviously, you guys are very uh, intelligent medical students. You've seen a ton of x-rays. Uh, you know how to recognize a shoulder joint without much work at all. But when I showed you very limited data, you couldn't recognize the patterns that you're used to seeing to know that this was the shoulder. Um, you had to get more and more data to be able to see the overall pattern to know what it is, even though you are looking at an x-ray. So that kind of... Uh, is really to, to demonstrate that being able to recognize patterns is something that allows you to exhibit intelligence. And it's the same for um, artificial intelligence algorithms. So an algorithm that can learn a pattern and be able to recognize that pattern in the wild, so to speak, or in new data is, um, is a characteristic of intelligence. Okay, so uh, I am gonna try and use this image in future slides, but uh, for anyone who doesn't recognize this, this is a this is a truffle. So if uh, you guys know truffles and your foods, truffles have a, a ton of intense flavor, and everyone really prizes their their taste, uh, and they're very valued. So I'm going to try and use this truffle image to to uh, signify that the information on this slide is of high value, and you should try and remember. Uh, that information for the future. Um, so kind of from me, if there's anything that you take away from this session, it's that AI uh, is an algorithm or a computer program, whatever you wanna call it, that identifies patterns in data and it uses those patterns to create a model which can be used to predict on new data that you get. So 
that is my definition of AI that I think you guys should learn and remember as medical students and future practitioners. All right, so in my very simple case study, I obviously show just like a simple linear regression example. That doesn't seem very exciting, but um, the reason that AI has been so uh, hyped up in the media these days and is becoming very popular in healthcare is now because AI algorithms, as Ricky demonstrated in many of those examples, can map very complex patterns. So from my, from my own research here, I'm just showing what that looks like. Um, on the left side here, I've got a truncated CT scan of a pelvic iliac crest. Um, this is just from a, from a model, it's not a human. And I essentially trained an AI algorithm to learn the patterns that would map a CT scan to an ultrasound scan. So on the right here is a completely synthetic uh, fake ultrasound scan, which is showing what the ultrasound scan essentially of this CT would look like. Um, and if you are familiar with what uh, ultrasound scans look like and how bone appears in uh, ultrasound, you might actually have a difficult time differentiating this synthesized ultrasound from a real ultrasound. And so because AI algorithms can now map these complex patterns, they are becoming um, extremely popular, I should say. Yeah. Okay, so great, AI algorithms are very useful at determining patterns, but what are the limitations? Going back to that same case study, which I've now plotted in red just to make it different. <laughs> Uh, let's say you had that same data. So you have the 30 patients between 60 and 85 kilograms and that linear trend. Now, what if a new patient comes in who is 100 kilograms and tells you that he wants to stop smoking? Uh, what do you tell them? Now, you'll notice that your data only goes up until 85 kilograms. You could assume that uh, this linear trend will just continue like this. And so, for example, like this. And so you could say, okay, well, uh, going by my linear trend at 100 kilograms, it will take you about 110 days to stop smoking. But you don't know that necessarily. So until you get this data, uh, or until you know this, um, until you have this correlation for this range, you're not sure. It could very well be that for some reason after the 90 kilogram mark, uh, it actually takes, there's some sort of polynomial relationship between uh, the number of days it takes to stop smoking and their weight. And so if without the data you had said, okay, I'm gonna assume the linear trend, you could be off by quite a, a wide margin without knowing. And so AI algorithms are not magic. They won't be able to know what the pattern is beyond the data that you've given it. So there is no, there's no sort of magic in here that the AI, the AI algorithm will be able to just learn everything about the data that you give it. Um, and this is the problem of generalizability. And this is one of the issues where AI algorithms have been, um, have failed, uh, especially in healthcare. So you might see very fancy, uh, attractive papers that are published in journals. Uh, and it sounds like the AI can do everything. Uh, but there's a reason that they're not used straight away in um, practice or in hospitals or in clinic. And that's because when they get exposed to new data, new types of patients or new centers, they often fail uh, compared to what, um, when they were tested in a, in a research setting. Uh, and once again, we will talk about this in more detail in the next few weeks. All right, so that's kind of the end of what I was going to uh, lecture on. So now I'm going to start like a more of a discussion period. Um, so as you know, COVID-19 happened, it kind of changed everything uh, that's going on in the world. But one of the things that you might have noticed, um, kind of when it started uh, here in, uh, in Canada and the States, is that everyone kind of leapt up. So I'm hoping uh, some of you are a lot of the Rings fans. This is one of my favorite scenes from the from the movies. But anyway, uh, this is the Council of Elrond. People are gathered here to discuss how to destroy the One Ring, uh, which is causing a ton of problem. But okay, so the ring here is COVID-19. Uh, and everyone, all these experts have gathered around essentially to uh, figure out how to, how to uh, make the situation less dire for COVID-19. Um, 
so many people you know said okay you know what uh, we'll start printing out uh, masks and uh, we'll start printing out uh, face shields you know we'll we'll 3d print everything to help you guys out so you don't contract uh, COVID-19 and you know so far and so forth people said okay we well, you know we'll give we'll give doctors 15 percent discounts on stuff so you guys can feel better about uh, dealing with COVID-19 patients and of course there are all the people who uh, who wanted to use AI and they just jumped on this bandwagon too and said okay you have my AI and we can uh, use AI to destroy COVID-19 and of course um, I don't know how you guys reacted to that, but it was kind of funny to see. Um, let's see what the chat says. <laughs> Glad you guys like these memes. So uh, my original plan for today was to um, criticize, sort of critique one of these COVID-19 prediction type papers that have come out, but uh, that job was already done for me and I actually found this excellent BMJ article, which I'm just going to open up now and um, sort of scroll through really quickly for you. Uh, but this BMJ article essentially uh, did a systematic review of all the COVID-19 AI papers that have come out since about March. Um, and what it found, sort of common themes that it found in these kinds of AI papers. And spoiler alert, it's, it's not positive. So, um, here, let's open it up. So this is the VMJ article. And um, so essentially, uh, I'll let you guys read the abstract later. But um, the methodology of this review was they identified a ton of uh, relevant papers. And they actually, surprisingly, I found this number quite staggering, but they found 14,200 articles that um, sort of me uh, mentioned COVID-19 and some sort of predictive model. Um, and so through more screening, they were able to exclude some papers. And in the end, they reviewed 107 papers, uh, which looked at 145 models. And these models were further categorized into what kind of uh, what kind of predictions they were trying to make. So some of these AI papers were trying to uh, predict which, uh, which types of people are more at risk of, of uh, contracting and suffering from COVID-19. Um, models to, pre to sort of predict the diagnosis of COVID-19 and then prognostic models as well. And um, the sort of review is quite scathing and uh, to conclude essentially what they found was that the prediction models are, even though they are kind of flooding academic literature, they aren't really good enough to be, to be helpful at all. Uh, and it says here sort of they are at high risk of bias, they're poorly reported, uh, and their performance is probably optimistic. And the reason this is happening is because AI has become such an attractive term, such an attractive field that people are jumping onto to do and conduct AI studies without really understanding its limitations, how it works and when it works. And so despite 107 different articles being reviewed, they could not, this article could not recommend any of these models to be used in current practice. And that is un quite unfortunate. Um, so how can we be better? So firstly, it's important to have a good understanding of AI, as we've been saying. Um, but this study um, also refers to this tripod checklist, which you guys might be familiar with. Um, but this checklist is essentially uh, different things. If you are doing a predictions model study, different things that you should include in your study to make it clear. And so I've just, um, I've got that copy of this this checklist here, and I'm happy to share all of these after the, uh, after the course. Uh, but it essentially says, uh, these are the things that you should definitely include in your study so, uh, so that people can understand um, how these models uh, are limited, what exactly they model, and how they can be used um, properly in a clinical setting. Yeah, so um, that's everything for today. I hope I was not too much over time. But if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask them and me and Ricky will be happy to answer.
All right, so see Ricky already answered some. question is what can students expect over the next few sessions so will the next three sessions will go over some what we think are really really major AI topics uh, for you to know um, so what Prash just did looking at that paper providing a critical analysis um, you can will provide you enough knowledge so that you can execute the same critical analysis and see for instance look they're overfitting their data to one center. It's not going to work when you extrapolate to other data. This is called overfitting. We'll show you that in the, the data science session next week. Um, so the next week is focused on mainly data science and a bit of machine learning, uh, how it ties into machine learning, because a lot of these problems that these papers stem is they're abusing data. They're abusing, they're not following best practices. Week three, we'll talk more about machine learning uh, specifically, how machine learning works and what situations you can use machine learning. And week four, we're gonna try to go in state of the art. So uh, convolutional neural networks, artificial neural networks, uh, random forest, random survival forest. These sound like buzzwords right now, but they're, they're widely known algorithms that we think if you know these algorithms, you might be able to understand uh, scenario where it applies in the future. And then the last week is a program workshop. It's, it's really fun. Students really liked it last year. You'll build your own um, decision tree AI algorithm to predict uh, a diagnosis based off some uh, imaging data. Uh, to answer Shelby, um, so my research, um, in case you missed it at the very beginning, I am actually uh, designing and building a computer assisted surgery system which makes pelvic fracture repair surgeries much more systematic and safer by making them less radiation dependent. And so what I was demonstrating with between the CT and ultrasound scans, um, that was just one sort of component in my research uh, where I was looking at if we can use CT scans, uh, whether they're from patients or models, to actually predict what the ultrasound scan would look like if we were to scan that patient during the surgery. Um, but the overall goal of my, of my research is to make um, orthopedic surgeries safer uh, by using ultrasound instead of X-ray images. Um, Borum asked, uh, how, how is the use of AI medicine in Canada? Actually, you might be surprised to learn that uh, Canada is actually quite a big leader in AI research, uh, particularly in Toronto and Montreal, where some of the big AI discoveries in the last decade were made. Um, so some of the big researchers and uh, scientists are actually running labs in, in AI. And so there have been many sort of healthcare and self-driving sort of startups in Canada. So uh, Canada is a big player along with the States, of course, and uh, sort of Germany and, and uh, the UK, uh, I would say. Um, cool. All right. Any more questions? Perhaps in the uh, interest of time, we'll end there, if that's okay, guys. Cool. Thank you. Um, awesome. Thank you, Ricky and Prash. And thank you for uh, being engaged, everyone. The, the chat was great. Um, just a few reminders. Please sign up on the Slack if you haven't already. Olivia will send an email about that. Uh, our next session is next week, uh, where we'll dive into some more technical terms and break things down. Thank you, the audience, for attending uh, nationwide, which is always fun to say. I feel like Peter Mansbridge at times on the, on the national. Um, yeah, and otherwise, have a good night. If you have any questions, shoot us an email, ask it on the Slack, uh, and we'll see you next week. Right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.